Serp Garage. All right, what we're going to do today, we're going to close the book for the Mill Serp Garage on the Lee Harvey Oswald uh, murder weapon that he used to kill police officer J.D. Tippett. And uh, here is the final pieces of information that I have here to clear up a few inconsistencies in uh, my last video. And then I'm going to leave it for you if you want to step any further down this path. There is just such a ton of information here that, um, you know, I think that in, a, uh, in an afternoon I'm going to do enough research to be able to do a video on touch on these things, but there is definitely many, many years of research done by people here on this exact topic. And uh, as much as we're into this whole uh, firearm thing, it uh, really opens up into a whole mess of other stuff once you start poking around. So um, this is where this is where things. Uh, the, the errors that I made here in my last video. Uh, first of all, Chris Chiampo, got to thank him for asking me, do I think that the whole cylinder was replaced in Oswald's gun? Or maybe it was just reamed out further to accept the longer Smith, uh, the longer uh, 38 Special case, and the cylinder is the, you know, from the same gun. And uh, where's my info here? So I said no. I said that's impossible. I underestimated how junkyarded out Lee Harvey Oswald's choice of weapons were. Um, the 38 Smith & Wesson with a case neck diameter of .386 is larger than the 38 Specials case diameter of .379. So I said, well, that's impossible. You're not reaming out anything to get the 38 Special to fit. Lengthwise, yes, but it's a, it's a thinner case, so that's impossible. There's no way to ream out and add material. The cylinder was too large for 38 Special. So uh, it's, it's not even a possibility. It had to have been that it was, that it was changed. And then this book came. I ordered this book before I did the video, like in research for doing the video. I learned of this book and I thought it'd be interesting to me and, um, and I bought it. Now, look at the size of this book, okay? This is no pamphlet here. The amount of information here that uh, Mr. Dale Myers puts out just, just on this case, it's incredible. But I liked it because it taught me one thing. As much as you might be into conspiracy theories with the whole JFK thing, if you are, or, I mean, nobody really knows the truth, so one way or another, even if you don't believe in conspiracies, you still might have a couple of different options floating around in front of you as to what the real truth is, you know. But I'm pretty convinced, after checking out this book, that um, Officer Tippett wasn't, involved or or you know a uh he wasn't a uh, complicit in the assassination which is see that's the sad thing is that so there might be a conspiracy over who killed kennedy but kennedy kennedy is looked at as an innocent just as a as a victim but um part of this uh conspiracy was that this cop they were thinking, like, you know, that there are stories, he's the one that did it, you know, and, like, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, because there is so much weird stuff going on with the, his killing and what rounds were left behind, what cases were left behind, the gun, there's so much of a mess that it turned into um, part of the conspiracy was that he actually did it. But after reading this book... It starts off this, it talks about him and, and um, about uh, what a family man he was. He was a, uh, a veteran. And um, even then again, towards the end, it gets into, uh, you know, talks about his family. And, and there's uh, like all kind of photographs and stuff 
Um, I'm just just from reading all of that. I mean, you can see how much information is really in this book. Um, I'm pretty convinced that uh, I'm pretty convinced that he was just an innocent. He was just a cop doing his job. And um, as I started looking through some of these pictures here, it actually starts talking about specifically. Let me get to it. It starts talking about uh, the weapon, the weapon itself, I and mean, it's just here—the revolver. It starts here on page three hundred five. Some of these pictures I had seen. Some of this stuff I hadn't. Here's the fake ID he used to buy it. This I hadn't seen before. This is the holster they found in his rooming house. That's everyone's seen this picture. That that holster. You could see that it's the holster if you if you look really close or a detailed picture of it. You know, a more um, a better picture of this. You could see it. That that is the revolver and the holster, and this is the rifle that he used to uh, that he used to uh, shoot Kennedy with. And I've seen things where his head is superimposed on this or whatever, just craziness. But this is what stood out to me when I got the book and I started reading. This is the first place I saw that they these are the four shell casings they found at the scene, and there's all kinds of nonsense. There's Two of them are for one brand, two are another brand. Doesn't match the bullets that they found at the scene, the brands of those. But they did match here through ballistics. They did match these casings to the breech face of the gun, for sure. But then they talk about how these are bulged. You can see that these are bulged, right? There's actually a, uh, there's a color photo... Uh, center section in this book. Let me see here. Get a better shot of them here, and you can see that these are all bulged. It's the first I'm reading of that of them talking about it, and they do have it accurate in here. Um, the information of the weapon and how it was modified. And when I saw this, I realized that Chris Ciampo was right. It was such a junkyarded gun. They didn't really re-chamber it, so to speak. They just lengthened the chamber to fit these 38 shell casings, 38 specials. But the cylinder was just as large, too large as the barrel was too large. So that's where you get bulged cases and bullets that don't... Uh, Bullets that don't uh, get, get the rifling on them the, the way they should uh, going down the barrel. So, then I realized I was wrong. And about that time comes a, con, uh, comes a comment from NY Half-Ass Prepper. And I got to thank him. You could uh, take a look at his comment on the last uh, video. At Oswald's revolver. He puts a link uh, on his comment too. He gives some information over some misconceptions I had about what the weapon actually was. And he puts this link. So this link leads to this. So I could save you, you could get it, and you could you could pull that link up, look along with me, or just look at what I printed out here. It's some interesting stuff here. Uh, so, during World War II, Smith & Wesson began production of the Victory Model, m and Military Police, Model 38 for the war effort in April 1942. Due to a shortage of weapons in Britain, a vast majority of these 5-inch barrel models were shipped under the Lend-Lease program as British service revolvers. They were designated as Smith & Wesson 38-200 as per the British contract with Smith & Smith and Wesson. So technically that's what it was, a Smith & Wesson 38-200. Here is the actual gun again, but here's what it looked like when it was first born, made by the United States with the lanyard ring and 5-inch barrel. It was modified, and then you could look somewhere along the way. This They're not really sure where it was uh rechambered they're pretty sure it was rebarreled at some place in California not rebarreled but the barrel cut down to two and a half inches and uh 
The lanyard ring was filled in and is gone. Here's the serial number. And um, here's the barrel, a closer look at the barrel. And online, this picture is very, very clear. It says 38 caliber. Here's the British proof marks. And the British proofed it here to, to three and a half tons or something like that. Where is that written? It's written here somewhere. I say. forgot exactly where, but they proofed it to that much. That's the, the, the charge that they would put in it and fire it to proof test it. And it says three and a half tons right here on the bottom. This is hard to read on the pictures I originally had. But these are the markings that the British put on them. This was cut down, the rear, the front sight moved. But, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a 38200. The chambers were not bored out diameter wise, only lengthwise. Bang, there it is right there. This is, this is definitely what was going on. One interesting thing here also. If you have one of these victory models, you're going to be running to the safe, I'm telling you right now. Oswald's revolver was re-gripped. So his assembly number, you know how Smith & Wesson's, they don't just have a serial number. This, of course, was the, this was the serial number, but they have an assembly number. Oswald's revolver's assembly number is 65248, but the grips had been changed. So if you have grips that say 65248, they came originally from his gun. Uh, the numbers on his grips are 74149. So if you have revolver 74149, uh, you're never going to find those grips because they're in the National Archives because they were on Oswald's gun. A little bit more information on the gun here, whatever. And then when you get to this, this, I didn't even realize. So now here's what I'm saying. If you wanted to like delve even further, I'm clearing up the misconceptions with the gun. And uh, just to let everybody know that I really don't believe Tippett had anything to do with it. As crazy as what was going on in the scene was, it was just because just Os Oswald was, uh, he was like the Fred Sanford of uh, firearms. He just had like a bunch of junk. We used to have, he has the fake ID that he used to pick it up with his picture on it. And they have his real ID and you can see that he just copied it. I mean, there's no, uh, definitely no conspiracy here. All trails lead to, uh, you know, Oswald being his killer one way or another, what, regardless of whatever the Kennedy stuff was, you know what I'm saying? And uh, then that led to a couple of other little, uh, a couple of other little rabbit holes here. Like I'm saying, I'm not, I'm just going to point you in the directions if you want to go. Uh, this is stuff about the mail order purchase and how it wasn't a conspiracy that it was all the answers to all the silly things like well what about this what about that this answers it all all the inconsistencies are all explained there and one last weird thing that actually wasn't figured out until last year or something was this receipt. So this was the receipt from uh, from Oswald's gun. Where is it? I just had it up here, but this is a small version of it. But it uh, just had it up here. But that receipt. What magazine did that come from? This was the the actual receipt that they they had. They had recovered it um, from. Uh, I guess I guess he had the original receipt somewhere in his apartment or whatever. And this was it. Or they got it at the company. I'm not sure. I guess I'd have to poke through this again. But they, they have it. And this was the back side of it. And they never could tell where he got that from. They didn't know what magazine this was from. And this this cartoon, it's like the bottom of a man's feet. He's like walking in the door. And it says, happy anniversary. And he says something after that. Or you can't really see what's going on. The people were actually even curious, like, what is the joke there, too? Like, that's what was on the other side of it. They looked and looked. They stood. They The Seaport Traders here, which, by the way, the Seaport Traders place, um, the address on... Here's Oswald's uh, original receipt. But this address, 
was uh, right around the corner from the Staples Center. It's a watch store now, but uh, I looked it up. Uh, but it's still, building still stands, and it's, uh, now it's a watch store. But they found some of these ads from Seaport Traders, like this one, they were narrowing it down by tracking these, like this AG2 and this AM6 here on these, on these ads. Somehow that had something to do with it. And uh, they finally got it. They finally figured it out. That was the magazine that it was in. This is what the original ad looked like. There's the coupon that was clipped. And that on the rear of it, that was the cartoon. This was the back page, the, the back of it, where the cartoon was. That This doesn't clear up the joke at all, actually. Happy anniversary, my little fat old blimp. I don't know. 60s uh, cartoons were definitely a little dry. I, I don't get that at all. Do you get it? I don't get it. Yeah, so that's how they figured that out. So that's something that, uh, you know, had been researched for years, but nobody could figure out what magazine he was looking at. So that was all part of, was that coupon even real? What was he reading? Was it really him that sent it in? But there it is, and there was some kind of date discrepancy, but they figured that all out. And even that, even that weird last weird thing where they, that left people scratching their heads just uh, up until last year was figured out. I recommend this book. If, if just going down this rabbit hole pointed me towards this book, it's one of those things. I get it from Amazon. I could have returned it. I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm okay with Amazon. I, I, like, uh, I like their return policy. I don't abuse it. But uh, I wouldn't read the whole book and send it back. But if it was something I looked at and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not going to drop the money on this. It's, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense. There's not any information here. I haven't even scratched the surface on this book yet. And I'm amazed at the amount of information. And it just makes for an interesting read because it's a, it's a, true, it's a true case study in witnesses and how what they hear and what they see can't be trusted. Um, it's not that they're lying um, on purpose. It's just that uh, it's just it's it's so been proven that uh, when it when something like that goes down, people's recollections are totally totally off base, and uh, you could put very little trust in what people tell you. Like that, they, they would swear they heard. There's people that heard three shots, five shots, six shots, two shots, and. Um, and uh, the, the and evidence finding of evidence and how evidence is treated and how it's marked and how it's uh, how it's processed was also interesting to see. You could uh, you could see here they show about how these shell casings are s s inscribed upon and signed by the different agencies that uh, they're passed from person when they're first found. They're marked just so that there could be the evidence could be traced that nothing was changed or altered and. Um, and I thought that was uh, that was really interesting, just following how that goes. I mean, there's pages and pages of this. They talk about it goes in more depth here, this book, than anything that I had seen online showing the other rounds that were inside the gun when they caught him, which were also mismatched, and rounds that were in his pocket that were also mismatched, that were similar to the cases that were, you know, found at the scene. It all matched. It was all very consistent. So it doesn't really matter how kooky and crazy your conglomeration of evidence is is it consistent and just when you get all the information right in front of you in a book this fat you realize that uh it is consistent um it really is and that uh you know a guy a guy like this who is a veteran and a dedicated uh cop that um it's a shame that uh, you know this, that all this misinformation would point towards uh, you know them implicating this guy. So uh, so that's it. This closes the chapter too. By the way, I don't want to. Uh, man, I realized that you could have like a whole channel just dedicated to uh, you know the the JFK conspiracy. I should have known better than start talking about that gun in specific ways related to anything conspiratorial but uh the model 10 its history its history is deep and um 
it just goes to show how many uh, how many stories uh, this type of gun like this has to tell, or even just this one specific one that did a long career in NYPD. What stories just this one could tell? You want to talk about uh, conspiracies? And uh, that's it for the Oswald chapter, ladies and gentlemen. I am closing the book, and the rest of the uh, the rest of the research is up to you. And uh, what are we going to be doing? Somebody wanted to see uh, the Model 14 again. Maybe I'll talk about that a little bit. Guys wanted to see the visible loader. Uh, I went to a gun store. One of my favorite. And uh, I saw at least five things. Five examples that I would grab up in a second. And that was scary because... Uh, you know, usually I just uh, kick tires and leave. It was at least five examples where I was like, I would buy that right now. But I always uh, like to think about things. I leave, I do research, I look around. Not so much just for pricing, but just to uh, just to see if I feel that it fits in the collection. And uh, I might visit back there again today. Uh, so today might be the day to pick something up. Not 100% sure, but we will see. So I got some stuff on the horizon. And uh, stay tuned. And uh, everybody stay well. And thanks again, New York half ass Prepper and Chris Ciampo. Appreciate your input. And uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, we uh, definitely couldn't have done it without you guys. And see you all later. Yeah, Zach! Ah! <laughs>